This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique <laughs> way. This is a show about science by scientists. Let's check out our team of hardcore nerds. Rita Davison is a biologist specializing in ecology and evolution. Rhinos have been hunted to near extinction. It's an illegal and deadly black market trade. A specimen like this could sell for close to $400,000. Now, the CSI team that's fighting back. This one is pretty squared off here. Hunting the hunters. Rhinos are gone, I think. How do you deal with that? Costa Gramanis is an engineer who designed everything from satellites in space to bionic eyes. Tonight, he goes one-on-one -on -one with a bot. Forget about football, meet the science squad. Kids from a Las Vegas school turning heads around the world. And I'm Phil Torres, I'm an entomologist. That's our team, now let's do some science. Hey guys, welcome to Techno. I'm Phil Torres, joined by Costa Gramatis and Marita Davison. Marita, you just did a fascinating story where you got to meet a man who spent over 30 years as a crime scene investigator for human victims. Now, he and his lab are taking on the fourth largest criminal industry in the world, and it is a tragic one. Yeah, I mean, we usually think about forensics having to do with human victims. We don't think of them as a bird or even a rhino, but that's what this lab is doing. It's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's forensics lab, and they're taking on the illegal trade in endangered species. Global problem with lots of ramifications. Some rhino species are nearly extinct. Just how large is this industry? Well, just in terms of economic value, we're talking about a $19 billion industry, so huge. And Techno got an inside look at the CSI Forensics Lab for Wildlife. The world's animal kingdom is under siege. Since 1970, animal populations have declined on average by half, according to estimates by the World Wildlife Fund. A big driver is wildlife trafficking. Illegal trade in wildlife is a big global business worth at least $19 billion a year. That makes it the fourth largest criminal industry in the world, right behind drugs, counterfeiting, and human trafficking. It's been connected to organized crime, militant groups, and even Al-Qaeda. The rhinoceros, one of the world's iconic creatures, is being devastated by the black market trade. Less than 30,000 remain in the wild, down from 70,000 just 40 years ago. Rhinos are on the cusp of extinction. Joseph Johns is chief of environmental crime for the U.S. Attorney's Office of Central California. The fact is, with wildlife, if you get caught, you may receive a slap on the wrist, maybe a small fine. If you traffic in cocaine and you're caught, you're going to go to prison for an awful long time. In 2012, he prosecuted a case against Jimmy and Felix Ka a Los Angeles father and son team suspected of smuggling millions of dollars worth of rhino horns and carvings. It was part of Operation Crash, a nationwide crackdown on rhino trafficking. The goods were destined for South Asia, where carvings are highly prized as a status symbol, and rhino horn powder is thought to cure cancer. What was probably most surprising about this case was seeing the correlation between the wildlife trafficking on the part of Jimmy and Felix Ka and the direct rise in murders or killings of rhinos in the wilds of South Africa. But what crime lab do you turn to when the victim has four legs and all you've got is a severed horn? This one, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Forensics Lab in Ashland, Oregon. Digits two and three on the right foot are discolored white. It's the world's only crime lab devoted to wildlife. It investigates cases for the U.S. as well as 180 other countries belonging to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, a treaty known as CITES. Our job is to speak for the evidence. Ken Goddard is the lab's director. He built it from scratch 
after a career investigating human crimes. So how would you say your work now is different from the work that you were doing as a CSI oh, investigator? Police work is repetitive. You're shoveling against the tide. Here, we're making a difference. We can save species, and we're pushing the envelope with our science every day. It's such a wonderful thing. The science starts when a package arrives in evidence processing, and with it, questions from a U.S. Fish and Wildlife field agent. Often, the first one is, what is it? In the case of the horns smuggled by the cause, the first question for the lab scientists was, are they rhino? This rhino horn is made of keratin, the same stuff your fingernail is made of. But on the black market, it's more valuable than gold or even platinum. A specimen like this could sell for close to $400,000. Determining the species can impact the penalty for a crime. That's because some are more critically endangered, like black rhinos. Less than 5,000 remain in the wild. So what are we looking at here? So the horns on the left are from a black rhinoceros and these on the right are from a white rhinoceros. Rhinoceros horns are unique in their morphology. Here's this really big one. If you look at the base, there's not this hollow center. The skull itself just has like a bony round portion and the horn sits on top of that bony portion of the skull. How would you be able to determine one species of rhino from another just by looking at the horns. The one on the left here is very round yeah. in the front. Yeah. You can see and that. that one's definitely flatter. And then this one is pretty squared off here. And that's a pretty unique way to tell the difference between the African species. But what if your evidence looks like this? When you get carved objects, it becomes much more difficult because you do not have any of the landmarks characteristic of the rhino horn. Ed Espinoza is deputy director of the lab. He also runs the chemistry unit. Turns out that there's a lot of plastics that resemble rhino horn, and so our job is to look at the chemical signatures, and these signatures tell us if an object is really made of rhinoceros keratin, or is it really a plastic? Once you have a positive ID that this is keratin from a rhino, what happens next? Then we give it to DNA. Mary Burnham Curtis runs the genetic unit. Extracting DNA from part of a victim is only one of the jobs here. It ranges anywhere from species identification for caviar or pieces of meat or matching a gut pile in the woods to some blood on a car to the deer in somebody's freezer. So it's a huge diversity. Yeah, and stuff from all over the world. In the case of Jimmy and Felix Ka, the lab had to analyze the DNA of more than 25 horns intercepted in the mail by fish and wildlife agents. So what we do is we try and go in and we drill out as close to the core of the horn as possible because that's the closest material to what was growing and obtain a little bit of tissue. We crush it up into a fine powder and then we put it into a, a liquid that's a detergent that breaks down whatever cellular material is in there. Now how much harder is it to extract DNA from something like a horn than it would be from a living animal? Horn or bone, the DNA is bound up in the harder matrix and so you have to break apart. Not only do you have to get the DNA out of the cells that it's in, but you have to break apart the bony matrix. The DNA extracted is compared with known rhino samples stored at the lab. It's a virtual Noah's Ark with 100,000 plus samples on file. And the freezers behind us are tissue samples. Tissue? Yeah, so okay. there's, there's tissue, there's egg, there's bone, but that's the source material for getting the DNA. The lab positively identified at least 37 of the horns trafficked by the cause as rhinoceros. But it's just one victory in the battle to save them. In 2013 alone, poachers killed more than 1,000 rhinos, a record high and whopping 50% increase over the previous year. People have to understand what danger these creatures are in. Rhinos are gone, I think. I don't think they stand a chance. Those horns are worth too much. How do you deal with that? On this day, Dr. Tabitha Viner is conducting an autopsy on a golden eagle submitted by a field agent. Often the animals are just found dead, and that's all the history that we have. So we have to use our skills and our knowledge and our senses to figure out what went on right before the animal died. Extending from the right side of the chest, and down the medial and ventral aspect of the right leg. 
is a tract of feather singeing. That singeing suggests the cause of death was electrocution, possibly by a power line. In these photographs, taken under a special forensic yellow light, those singed parts glow orange, further proof the bird was electrocuted. Even bones can unravel mysteries, like this bear skull. The character of the hole through the skull, the fact that it's kind of oblong, that it's kind of beveled on one side, yeah. and it's shorter on that side, and it's not as beveled on this side, and the fact that the bone is discolored around it. Right, I can see that for sure. Yeah, is more indicative that that's a gunshot wound. If the bones are needed as evidence in court, the body is skeletonized, not by a lab technician, but by nature's own cleaning crew. The lab's colony of flesh-eating dermestid beetles can strip a carcass clean in a matter of days. You're dealing with kind of the gory details here, right? Do you find yourself ever being personally impacted by what you're seeing on the table? When I see something that indicates that there was suffering prior to death and they're slowly wasting away and starving, that's when it gets a little hard. But if I just think of everything as a stuffed animal, if you will, yeah. it makes it a little easier. The shock is the few times I've seen the animals grievously harmed, but not dead. The horn cut off the rhinoceros, but it's still alive and moving around. Uh, that enrages me. I know that if I can keep this lab team right down the line, unbiased, good science, we're going to help take down the bad guys over and over again. Those wildlife investigators will have us behind them, and that's what we need to be. Operation Crash has been not about the poacher, it's been about the middleman, mm -hmm. and oftentimes they're finding specimens where the rhino has been long dead. Why do we want to bring those guys. Well, first of all, justice. we want the trade stopped. True. Yes. Uh, I didn't make that pound of cocaine in Bolivia. I just transported it. Well, it's still illegal. It's the only way we can stop the killing. That's what we have to do. Jimmy and Felix Ka pleaded guilty to five felonies for smuggling rhino horns. They were sentenced to more than three years in prison and thousands of dollars in fines. John sees a direct link between their conspiracy and the increase in rhino deaths. If there is no profit in supplying rhinos, the poachers don't go into the wilds to kill them. So the very fact that Jimmy and Felix Ka were helping to create the market made them morally culpable for the killings of the rhinos in the wild savannas of Africa. And so for those people that still purchase rhino horn, I would suggest to them that they have blood on their hands. Now, Marita, do you think this sentence and fine is enough to send a message to the rest of the people in this industry that they shouldn't be doing it? In my opinion, I don't think it is anywhere relative to the scale and magnitude of the crime committed. And, you know, this is a huge industry. It's a big problem. If we are going to actually deter this kind of activity, the penalties need to be a lot stronger. And you hear about big busts for criminal activity like human trafficking or drugs, but you don't hear a lot about this industry. And rhino horn is, is literally like equivalent to a fingernail. Yes. Like it's the same stuff. It's keratin. Keratin. Yes. I couldn't believe the value of that horn you were holding in your hand. I know. That is unbelievable that something so meaningless can sell for so much money and cause so much strife. Yeah, and I think that that's at the crux of the issue here, Phil, is that folks like like Ken Goddard at the Forensics Lab, they are trying to make these activities have very serious consequences. That's one way to get at the problem. The other way to get at the problem is to take away the value that these items have, you know, for society. It's a much bigger issue to tackle, but that's really, I think, the only way we're really gonna make any sort of difference. And keep in mind, this, this uh, Forensics Lab, it's the one and only in the world the one and only. $19 billion industry and we're throwing one forensic lab at the problem? Like, right. you can catch 20 people a year? Is that nearly enough to scratch the surface? No. I guess I'm sure for all of us, being a scientist required one important thing when we were younger. 
and that was a mentor. I know for me, it really paved the way to being an entomologist. Me too. I had mentors all along my path of uh, development, still do. I think it's really important. Uh, every day I was in an electronics store hanging out with the owner, <laughs> learning how to build all sorts of electronic gadgets. Really? That, that was, was it for you? That was after high school every day. <laughs> that is awesome. Now, Costa, you recently went to Las Vegas to meet this incredible mentor and his awesome team of high schoolers. Yeah, Costa, what happened in Vegas? <laughs> well, I can't tell you everything that happened in Vegas, but I will tell you that the, the kids at Simran Memorial High School have invented incredible robots that are competing across the country and they got to travel all the way to China to, to bring robots there as well. It's, it's an amazing story. Let's check it out. There may be high-level rivalries between the United States and China, but on this day in Shenzhen, China, thanks to some brilliant teenagers, there is nothing but detente between the two countries. They told me how to talk with each other and uh, how to get a good teamwork. It's about growing together. It's about helping everyone do what they can at the best of their ability. And I think this is something that everyone can learn from. Young people from China and the United States working side by side, sharing a common interest in robots. The team from Las Vegas, the 987 High Rollers, were invited to share their expertise with Chinese students. You think that like they would be more advanced than us in technology, but this not, isn't a thing that they have at their high school level. We went over there and just kind of showed them what they would need to run teams like this and what it would take to run a competition. It's really cool to bring something that we know so well and to bring it here and introduce them to it and get to see their faces when they see something new that we can do and that they can do possibly in the coming years. Back in Las Vegas, at Cimarron Memorial High School, it's the love of technology, in this case robots, that have helped turn the lives of some American teens around. And this isn't like some top tier high school. Oh no, we are a Title I low income school. Over 50% of our students are on free or reduced lunch. You wouldn't classify this as a rich school, that's for sure. We are actually currently a turnaround school. What does that mean, turnaround? It means to find out why the graduation rate was falling. When I got here, it was 51%. We're already back up to a 70%. And programs like this are part of the reason? Absolutely. These are the great kids. Oh, that's fine. What is a crash? It, it sends the bit through the material, so it, it destroyed our bit. So it wasn't a very good moment, but definitely a learning one. Team 987 High Rollers home base is this 4,000 square foot workshop where kids often spend 12 hour days, sometimes seven days a week, building bots. School funds, grants, sponsorships, and countless car washes support the team and also bought them a brand new $50,000 Haas CNC machine that fabricates parts for building robots. Hey, Mr. Rogers, what's your feed rate? So right now we're going conservative on this machine. And Trevor, what did you program in for feed for the pockets? For the pockets, I went at a 14 inches per minute. It's a team, and this team is every bit as popular and every bit as important as any other team on, on campus, the football team, the wrestling team, the baseball team. So it's on par with, with the athletics. And like sports teams, the school is proud of championships. The high rollers have brought home some big wins from competing in national first robotic events. So you turned down magnet schools to come to this school. And I think it was definitely worth it. Why? Because this team is unique in so many different ways. It has different machining equipment that no other school has access to. It has mentors who are completely dedicated during school and after school. Problem solved. <laughs> yeah. And it's got just the best students from all around the valley. Success is due in part to STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math that fosters this kind of learning. And in a discipline that is traditionally male-dominated, the high rollers are different. 
I wouldn't say it's intimidating. You wouldn't say? I wouldn't say it's intimidating. We run a lot on this team, just like the guys do. It's 50-50 for both the guys and the girls on the team. We work just as hard as they do. What happens if you use the wrong G-code? It'll actually crash the party. Who really gets more done? The girls do. Girls are better at everything. I started coming around the shop and being around the guys, and I started to really like being around in the mechanical part of it, so that's how I got into wanting to be an engineer. We just say, okay, on Wednesday, we're gonna learn how to use the CNC machine, girls only. And then they wind up learning more than the guys because they're dedicated and coming here. And then when they know more than the guys, they're able to teach them a thing and it's not intimidating. Ladies night at the CNC machine. <laughs> exactly. What may be intimidating to the uninitiated are the robots themselves. It would definitely be more complicated than your average car. The level of sophistication of these robots is astounding. Built in only six weeks by a team of students, they are designed to win. Hit it, Brandon. And they're built like tanks. They are programmed to complete a competitive task. In this case, for fun, throwing frisbees at a certain techno contributor. Oh, God. What have you noticed about this generation, this class of students, and are they more sophisticated in their technological understanding, and are they appreciated for that? What's the cultural phenomenon going on? I think we are witnessing a cultural shift. When I was a student on this team when I was in high school, being on the robotics team was kind of social suicide. Instead today, students involved in this program are graduating high school with honors, with many getting full rides to major universities. I'm thinking Academy is one of the military academies, and I'm really interested in what the military has to offer uh, technology-wise. I'm looking at either UNR or Berkeley. I would like to be a science or math teacher. I think that'd be cool. I want to come back and help just volunteer for things and mentor and see if I can make some type of difference. What I love is that girls are front and center here, and they, I mean, they're, I, I love that part. <laughs> it's like a, the team is a 50-50 split of, of uh, uh, boys and girls, and, and they have literally a ladies' night with the robots. And let's talk about the fact, I mean, they took their knowledge to China, and they got to share it and have this complete cross-cultural experience. What was it like talking to them about that? They didn't know how to articulate what they saw and felt, but they're like, it was awesome. The food was weird, you know? <laughs> and, and, and the number one thing that, I, that was so powerful in that moment was how they talked about how they made friends. They literally went to another country and were so thrilled that they could find a commonality in building robots together that the Chinese are no longer this elusive people, they're their friends now. I love it. Robots bring people together. Yep. Big robot. Science brings people together. <laughs> awesome. I love it, guys. Those are the moments that the show is all about here on Techno. We follow the science wherever it takes us. And if you guys want to see more, be sure to check us out next time here on Techno. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and more.